Catherine Burmeister, welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. Thank you for having me, Jonathan. Yeah, it's a pleasure to be with you today. I'm excited to have a nice conversation about work-life balance, and we're going to be exploring your book, Overcoming Addiction to the Status Quo, and really talk about creating and then you know, achieving that ever-elusive work-life balance kind of concept that we hear about and talk about a lot. I think this is a particularly important topic uh, during this pandemic, as people's lives have been uh, thrown for a loop. And I think the whole idea of balancing between work, uh, family, school, you know, all the different competing priorities and, and making it all work for us. Uh, and while we're still able to be, you know, productive employees, I think that's, that's as important of a topic as it has ever been during this pandemic. As we get started, I wanted to share Catherine's bio with everybody. Catherine Burmeister makes a point to live every day. As an attorney, she is a tireless advocate for her clients. As a human being, she channels her passion for others into animal rescue, charities, and other causes. She's an entrepreneur, author, and speaker on beating adversity and women's self-care. Catherine has served on the board of directors uh, for, uh, how do you say that, Catherine? Ahimsa House. Uh, uh, Catherine has served on the board of directors for Ahimsa House, a nonprofit that helps domestic violence survivors and their pets get out of abusive situations. She is a member of the Animal Legal Defense Fund, a nonprofit whose mission is to protect the lives and advance the interests of animals through the legal system, and is a member of the Pro Bono Program Network, a member of the ACLU, a nonprofit that works through the legal system and communities to defend and preserve the individual rights and liberties that the Constitution and laws of the United States guarantees everyone in this country. Uh, she's a former member of the Female Founder Collective, a network of businesses led by women that enables and empowers female-owned and led businesses to positively impact communities, both socially and economically. She is also a member of the Georgia Trial Lawyers Association, whose mission is to protect the constitutional promise of justice for all by guaranteeing the right to trial by jury, preserving an independent judiciary, and providing access to the courts for all Georgians. And I really could go on and on and on. You're a busy woman. Uh, you have your, your hands in a lot of different things, and, and I commend you on all the good work that you're doing. Um, now, as we launch on in, anything else you would like to share with listeners by way of your background? Uh, no, I, I think you pretty much covered it in terms of me being a lawyer, and um, that's really kind of what led me to write my book. Um, so maybe that's a good place for me to start in our conversation. Yeah, yeah. Let's talk about your book. Uh, what was the motivation behind it, um, the impetus for it, uh, and then we can start to talk about some of the main points from it and and build into this work-life balance idea. Absolutely. So I have always wanted to be a lawyer, uh, really since middle school, and so being an overachiever, box checker, A-type personality, I set myself on that path early. So when I finally got my dream job after graduating law school and game licensed, I found a great firm to work for, and everything was going great for about a year and a half. And then I got a call from my senior associate, um, not the partner who owned the firm, but the associate. And he said that we all need to be in before staff. And of course, that's never usually a good thing, right? Um, but I had no idea how bad it was going to be. So when we got in there, we found out that our partner had committed suicide. He had been stealing from clients for eight years and he left notes detailing it and explaining between this or prison, I'm choosing this. He had daughters, he had new grandbabies. Um, so needless to say, this was traumatic aside from the obvious. He was somebody who really taught us well and really let us learn by actually doing, did not keep us under his thumb. So reconciling who we thought we knew and who did something completely opposite, obviously, to what we believed as a you know, group, but him in particular thought he believed was tough. So after that, the senior associate, myself, and one paralegal decided to try and continue the firm. And so for about a year, we tried this and I ended up running the practice basically on my own with the paralegal helping me. My partner at that point checked out mentally and physically. He was just MIA um, and understandably he was affected by everything, but that's the point. We all were very affected by what happened. So finally, everything came to a head when I came back in town from a much <laughs> deserved and needed trip. And he wasn't there. He was at a, on a retreat in middle Georgia. Um, and I just, I really could not process another single thought. And 
all I knew was that I needed to get home and I need to call my husband. Um, I was starting to have suicidal ideations and I should say that I've dealt with anxiety and depression since probably high school and mental health um, is something that's in my family and very you know, spoken about. So luckily I'm aware enough and I was aware enough at that point to know where I was mentally. And it's not that I didn't want to be here. I was just so exhausted and every waking minute was filled with trauma and turmoil and I just couldn't turn it off. And I finally hit that point where I was done. And so luckily I called my husband, he met me at home, but I ultimately ended up hitting what I uh, refer to as my rock bottom of my addiction to the status quo. And so I should mention that when I say addiction, I don't use that term flippantly. I genuinely believe it is an addiction um, in the same sense that others are insofar as we will do things and not do things to our detriment to live up to the internal and, expect, internal and um, external expectations that we set on ourselves based on what society has telling us that we have to be. So um, that's when everything just switched literally overnight. And when I came to find out after writing my book was what really shifted, it wasn't just some magical thing. Um, really, I had finally proven to myself that I was enough. And up until that point, even though I was always an overachiever and went above and beyond and obviously stuck through this very traumatic situation, I still hadn't believed that. And so ultimately that's what changed and it's completely changed my life. I mean, that's an understatement. Um, I am so much happier and I am a completely different person, I think, because of what happened to me. Well, thank you for sharing that, for, for being vulnerable enough uh, to, to share the trauma and the those hard things. And, you know, I, I think we certainly all deal with various forms of trauma and, and mental health challenges are certainly um, a common uh, thing that, that individuals have to deal with. And I think particularly during the pandemic, we've seen a, a really sharp increase in the number of um, mental illness related issues and, and incidences. Um, I think, you know, uh, mental health challenges also run in, in my family. And so, you know, I, I think it, it's, it's a really good thing that we can take the stigma off it and just talk about it and be open about it so that things can be addressed. You know, just like if I break my arm, I go to the hospital, uh, I get it fixed. You know, I, I see a doctor, I get it taken care of, I take medications as I'm healing. Uh, it's, it's the same thing when we're dealing with mental health issues. And uh, for whatever reason, uh, that has not traditionally been viewed that way um, in at least in our culture and uh, we can certainly help to to uh, change that and as I was listening to you share your story you know some of this resonates with me I I, I figure uh, I probably have a lot of that type a uh, personality too and I certainly have the you know I have kind of just this burning within me to try to please people and to try to achieve and accomplish things and always help people and, and so forth uh, in a lot of ways, that's great. Uh, you know, I, I get to to impact a lot of things, and and I I take satisfaction in that, and I get I get to see, you know, how people's lives are improved and whatever. So that's all great. Uh, on the one hand, on the other hand, yeah, I mean, why do I do all of that? Um, and and some of it is like you said, it's, it's it's really because that's what I know. It's because that's what I've always done. Uh, part of it is simply because of these external pressures and norms that I feel like I have to live up to people's expectations um, when really I don't. Uh, and so I think all of us have to wrestle with those things and ultimately decide what is really most important. And so that's what I hear you saying as you're describing that the concept for this book, Overcoming Addiction to the Status Quo, that we disrupt uh, our our own personal status quo and how, why we're doing what we're doing and understanding that. And then ultimately uh, making sure that we're practicing self-care so that we don't get to the point where we're having burnout, where we're having suicidal ideation and, and other uh, such trauma that can impact not only us, but our, the, our organizations, our families, our communities. Absolutely. So um, I think I think everybody's impacted by the status quo to a certain degree. Um, I obviously am a lawyer uh, by training, but I, and I think it manifests more drastically in certain professions and um, earlier in certain professions. So doctors, lawyers, uh, corporate executives, nurses, and even elite athletes, those professions where like a very early age, typically 
you start setting yourself on that trajectory. Either it's, I know I want to be a lawyer or like you're an overachiever and start pushing yourself that way. Um, but the reality is everybody is impacted by it and it's preconceived societal shoulds, right? And you can be a stay at home mom and be looking at Pinterest and be like, I'm not making <laughs> organic gluten-free cupcakes with all the handmade designs, you know, for my kids, I'm a failure at being a mother. That's a societal should, right? And it doesn't mean that that's true at all. You're a human being who is, is just existing, right? Trying to live a life. Um, so everybody's norms are different. Um, and the status quo is different for everybody. But what it really gets to the root of is happiness. And for me, the definition of happiness is living the best version of yourself. Obviously, everybody's different. So that is different for everybody. But if everybody is so focused on what they should be, they never actually tune into what they are. And not only what they are, but what do they want to be? Is what they are, is that make them happy? Then great. Nine times out of 10, that's not the case. So really finding out where you are, where you want to be, and how you get to that point. And with the goal being living the best version of yourself, because I think the saddest thing that can happen in life is you get to the end of it and you look back and say, wow, I really wish I'd done things differently. We all have bills to pay. We all have to work uh, to pay those bills, but we can have this um, balance in life that allows us to encounter challenges and um, other experiences in a healthy and productive way. Yeah, well said, well said. And ultimately what that looks like is a little bit different for everyone, right? Uh, Absolutely. In, ter in terms of that balance, the self practicing the self-care and making, you know, everyone's threshold and what they can handle is, is different. And, you know, we're, it's really dangerous for us to compare ourselves to other people <laughs> in that regard. Um, and, I, and I know that's, again, that's just a kind of a societal cultural norm that we, we all tend to do it. I think it's human nature, uh, but we need to learn to get past that and just learn what, what makes sense for us, what works for us, what doesn't, and then align our daily activities and our self-talk to, to be consistent with what's going to be healthy for us. And so when we talk about this idea of work-life balance, um, I know it's kind of a, uh, a trendy term and, and lots of people are talking about it. Um, and certainly there's lots of things organizations can do to make sure that their people are taken care of and that we're not exploiting our workers and those sorts of things. Uh, but the reality is it's just different for everyone. What, uh, what a healthy balance in life looks like for me may be different than what it looks like for you or even for my spouse, my children, whatever. And, and I have to be self-aware enough um, and, and willing uh, to align myself with, with my needs. I have to be willing to do that and aware of it in order to be able to do it. Otherwise, I'm going to fall into the trap of just getting sucked into these societal expectations, these career expectations, these whatever you know, set of norms are, are out there. And, and I'm, then I'm not living for myself. I'm living for other people. I'm living to meet these expectations. And even if I get some level of satisfaction, you know, personal satisfaction from you know, checking a box or from achieving something that someone else says I should achieve, that's really a short-term kind of um, satisfaction. It, it fades so quickly. Uh, and it's not sustaining. It's it's not going to keep you going when things are hard. No, and that's uh, a very good point to make. It um, it's it does feel good, right? It feels good when we um, think we're doing things that we should be because I think by nature we're kind of you know a group species, right? We want to belong. We want to be part of something, even if it's not necessarily the best thing for us, we still don't want to go against the grain. And I'm not saying, you know, going against the grain, like dyeing your hair and getting piercings, right? <laughs> I'm just talking about the basic ideas of saying, I want to be happy in my life. And people say that and say that they're happy, but I don't think they really recognize what happiness is. A lot of people turn to inanimate objects um, and money to say I'm happy or I'm successful. And the reality is, yes, money makes things easier. There's definitely a threshold that we need to cover in terms of our basic needs. But past that, money in and of itself does not make you happy. It's the experiences that you can have with that money. Um, and I would challenge that, I, I, you're right, work-life balance is a very trendy topic. Um, 
it's not possible to have a balance in terms of, you know, 50, 50 or 33, 33, 33, 33, every single day, right? You're lucky if you can have it on any given week that you have a balance. But what it really means is aligning your life to include the things that give you value um, and the things that you need to do in so far as, um, you know, keeping yourself alive, keeping your work going, you know, providing for your family. It's not necessarily that you want to, you know, go clean your kid's room, but you've got to help them. And this is part of life. You have to do certain things you don't necessarily want to do, but it doesn't mean giving up who you are because of societal norms or expectations um, that are being put on you and you put on yourself. I think too often we are our own worst critics or, um, you know, just in, in thinking that we need to be a certain way. And it's hard to step away from, because you can't, right? You can't step away from your internal voice about uh, what you believe for so long. So reprogramming that is a huge part of this process towards happiness is learning what's, what's real in terms of, you know, is there evidence to support what I'm believing about myself or what I believe I should be doing? If there isn't, then you move forward and, kind of, and you know, process it from there. And if there is, take it, learn from it, and maybe shift how you do things. But the first step is challenging those thoughts. And all too often, they become so natural for us, we don't know how to challenge them because we don't identify them as being abnormal in any sense of the word. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So as we start to recognize this, and we want to disrupt the unhealthy patterns in our life, uh, challenge the status quo, as you say, um, what, what do you see as some of those first steps in creating and achieving that healthy work-life balance, whatever that means for you? Yeah, I think literally the first step is recognizing whether you're happy where you are or not. Um, it's it's the, the age-old phrase, you know, acknowledging you have a problem before you can start recovering from it. Um, and that's true. If you don't believe you're unhappy, then why would you change anything? So recognizing whether you're truly happy or not. And if you're not, that's okay. That's first step. Then recognizing that you want to change it. You have to be willing to put in the work. It's not something that happens overnight, unfortunately, even though it sounded like in my situation, it did. I've been very proactive with my mental health for a number of years before that. And that's my whole point is it shouldn't take something catastrophic happening before you start shifting and being proactive with your life um, and your happiness in the long term. So recognizing the work that's going to have to go into it. And then the meaningful step that you can first take, and I do this with my, um, my clients uh, when I coach, is figure out what your values are. And I think of us as like little human startups um, doing mission, vision, and values. And the reason I do that, uh, because you need to know where, first of all, where you are, second of all, where you want to be. But if you've never had to live your life based on those parameters before, because you've just been living up to everybody else's expectations or societal expectations, you need to have some parameters and mission, vision and values give you parameters like they do in companies. Um, you can make decisions within those confines. And if it's outside of what you value or what you're trying to do with your life, it's a lot easier to say yes or no based on those guidelines. Um, so you can't expect somebody to change and not have any guidance on how to do it, especially if they've never done it before, because if they'd done it, they wouldn't be where they are. So really challenging yourself, being willing to put in the work and realizing that you've got to start at ground zero, which is who am I and what do I want to be from here? And I mean, that, that's a lot, right? That <laughs> yeah. sounds like you're going through a <laughs> so midlife lot. crisis, um, yeah. you know, a, <clears throat> an existential crisis where you're trying to figure out like your, your identity. And I know that does sound like a lot. Maybe that sounds like a little bit too much that more than people want to bite off and chew. Um, but that really is kind of what you have to do. I mean, you have to challenge your, your life assumptions. Uh, you have to recognize, you know, what you have to understand and recognize what has worked for you and what hasn't, and then have the courage to step forward into some uncertainty uh, to, to do more of those things that align with who you are, who you want to be. Like truly, not just because of other people telling you that's what you need to be. It is a lot. Um, and I mean, we're talking what in 25, 30 minute conversation. And this is something that um, I feel fortunate to have learned in such an early part of my life. I wouldn't wish what happened to me on anybody. But in a sense, it's been the biggest blessing that's ever happened. Um, but you don't have, it doesn't matter how old you are, first of all, before you decide to start this process. Second of all, 
it's ongoing. That's the other part of this is yes, I've acknowledged this and being able to have this experience in my life and shift my perspective, but it's not like I've checked off another box. I'm a recovering box checker. Uh, and it's not like you check it off and you're done. I'm happy. That's, that's not at all how this works. Um, it's an ongoing process, but it's like anything else. The more you do it, the easier it gets. Um, and it's like exercising muscles. The more you do it, the less of a strain you have on your body. So really taking the first step is I think the biggest part of it. And it's scary. There's no doubt about it. It's a, it's a lot to process. And that's why I've started doing the coaching with lawyers is because it's a lot to just hear this and go, holy cow, where do I even start with this process? Yeah. She says mission, vision, and values, but where do I go from there? It's, it's a lot to consume. Um, but I would say that the worst thing that could happen is you get to the end of your life and look back and say, I wish I'd done it differently. Nobody's going to say, wow, I wish I worked more or I wish I was more miserable. (laughs) You know, uh, nobody's going to say that. And so to me, the alternative is so much worse than putting the work in now and uh, living what time you have here, whatever that is in a healthy and enjoyable way. Yeah, yeah, well said. And I, I, I'm not even sure what facilitated it, but um, early on uh, in my uh, young adult life, I, I came to the realization that checking boxes like as an approach to feeling (laughs) achievement, like that was not um, something I wanted to continue. And I think it's something I've worked on and it's, it's been this tension within me ever since. Like I recognize I don't want to do it yet. It's kind of my natural tendency. (laughs) Um, And so, so I have to like, uh, I really have to make efforts to disrupt that even decades later, Um, you know, as after realizing that's something I didn't want to do anymore. And so this is a long-term kind of a thing that we're talking about uh, as we're trying to find you know, our balance. Um, the last thing I'll say, and I know we're almost out of time, um, but we've been focusing on the individual and the individual being able to figure out what they need, setting boundaries, practicing self-care to find that work-life balance that works for them. Um, we should at least note that uh, organizations and leaders also play a huge role in this. And we don't have time to get into that today, but uh, it, it really is important if you're leading people that you recognize them as <clears throat> uh, valuable autonomous individuals with innate value that have lives outside of work. Uh, you don't own them. Um, you, you know, you, their well being is not only important you know, to them as human beings, but it's important to the organization in terms of just the, the business case for, for any organization, the, the better uh, your people are in terms of their mental health, their physical health, their, uh, their, their excitement and commitment to work, all of those types of things lead to better team dynamics, more innovation, more creativity, higher productivity. So, I mean, as, as organizations and as leaders, we also really need to think long and hard about what we're asking our people to do. Um, Are we honoring boundaries that are reasonable uh, in terms of work-life balance? Are we modeling, uh, you know, healthy work-life balance for our people so that we give them permission to practice it themselves? And, uh, you know, those types of things we can also contribute tremendously to our people um, having, you know, living living, uh, meaningful, healthy, lives both in and out of work. Yeah. And I would like to touch on that real quickly. So when I started my law practice back in 2018, I um, wanted to be remote. I just had no need to one, spend the cost, but two, um, I love working from home. I don't have kids. So I have the ability to do that. Um, But it was very fortuitous. What with, you know, the pandemic and everything that came along. So I've been remote since my inception. My paralegals are all out of state. I've had them for coming up on three years now. And I, firmly believe there's a strict difference between managing and leading people, which I'm sure based on what you're saying, you feel the same way. So leading people, and I'm sure people have a concept, but it's basically you have to emulate what you want back from people. And so if you're willing to work on yourself and focus on your well-being and happiness, other people are going to feel 
like they have permission to do the same thing. And when people are happy, they want to work and work hard and they believe in the cause that they're working for. To that end, you do have to recognize that they are individuals. So I'm proud to say that even though I've never met two of my paralegals in person, I have a company that's run for, you know, however many years now, and there's buy-in. I mean, they want to do well. They have no problem reaching out to me and saying, hey, I've got such and such going on. Fine. Family first in my book, right? Nobody's going to die at the end of the day in my profession. Thank goodness. Um, But yeah, it's really all about showing what you want from people by doing it yourself. And your organization is going to run so much better from it because you've taken the time to invest in yourself. And then other people feel the permission and the validity investing in themselves, which comes together to make everybody successful at the end of the day. Yeah, excellent. Well, Catherine, it has been a real pleasure talking with you today. Excuse me. Sorry about that. Catherine, it's been a real pleasure talking with you today. It's it's uh, really been great to hear your insights and examples and, and all the great things you're doing in your practice and for your clients. Uh, before we wrap up today, I wanted to give you a chance to share with listeners how they can get connected with you, find out more about your work, your team, and then give us a final word on the topic for today. Yeah, so the best place to reach me is at Linktree and it's KF as in Frank Burmeister, that will take you to links of all my social media, my websites, my law firm website, and my um, author speaking and coaching website as well. So, and I'm on social media, of course, and there's links to that too. So I love to hear from people. Feel free to reach out to me. If I can be of service, um, please let me know. Wonderful. Thank you so much. I encourage listeners to reach out, get connected with Catherine, find out more about what she can do for you. And as always, I hope everyone can stay healthy and safe, that you can find meaning and purpose at work each and every day. And I hope you all have a great week.